we'll get started here. Um, just want to say how much I appreciate everybody's time tonight uh, and your passion for uh, the sport we all love. Uh, we have Brett Jackson, board chair of USA Curling, is on as well. Roger Smith, board member, I see here. There may be some other board members on as well. So, welcome to all of them. Uh, Want to keep this as an open forum, but I, I will start out with um, just a few uh, overview things to get things started because I imagine some of them are things that people uh, will want to address during this meeting. A couple of things I want to cover first, though, just the fact. Um, I have had some feedback where people have maybe uh, had criticism of the Governance 4.0 Ad Hoc Committee for the structure of membership tiers, et cetera. And I just want everybody to know that that's not what the uh, Governance 4.0 Ad Hoc Committee, if you have issues with membership tiers or pricing or fees, um, that's on me and USA Curling. Uh, what the membership, what the Ad Hoc Committee did was give us a framework uh, for a new membership model, but uh, they weren't uh, tasked with setting fees and everything else. They did terrific work and we're much appreciative of, of the work that group did. I also wanna uh, make sure everybody knows that this is a plan, um, this new model. Uh, it will be discussed with regional associations, club presidents, and the rest of the curling community starting tonight. Uh, it all, discussions have already been underway and that will continue. Um, throughout until the October members assembly uh, where this the proposal will be voted on. So this is a plan. Uh, we think it's a good plan, um, but that's where it's at right now. Uh, last thing I'll cover before I turn it over to questions um, is that we did get a lot of feedback on this coach membership and how that might be overly complicated. So what we have decided to do is make a change there. Uh, if you are a coach member, uh, a coach slash competitor membership, either of those would be an upgrade to $100 from the basic membership, but a coach would be, with a coach membership, you would also be eligible to play in national championships. What you will have to do with a coach membership is complete a coach certification course that we'll be introducing in the fall, and that will give you access to the coach liability insurance, the free background screen, and some other educational sessions going forward, but it will be one upgrade. Uh, and I could understand the confusion we created where people thought uh, the two upgrades would be complicated. So that is something we're resolving. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it over to Brett in case he wants to add something before we get started, but uh, and then we can start with questions. I know that the chat's open, but Brett, if you wanna add anything here. Yeah, sure. Good evening and, and good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as we go through and vet uh, the model, uh, the board uh, adopted what the committee had given us, uh, with the exception of one recommendation around playdowns, and, and the board elected to just keep playdowns uh, at the regional level. But other than that, the uh, the the work that you see is a direct representation of what the government governance 4.0 committee came up with. Uh, this was a membership driven idea. Uh, and Dean is just taking the framework uh, that the committee gave and is executing on their direction, saying that we do want to, the, the committee recommended uh, unanimously a tiered membership model uh, and left it up to uh, the staff to figure out exactly where the tiers lie and the dollar amounts and everything. I really, really want to express uh, our deep appreciation for all of the volunteer members of that committee uh, and the work that they put in over months uh, to to come up with their recommendations. And uh, just so glad that, uh, as I said, that that everything that we're doing uh, is inspired by and directed by the membership, uh, because I think that's really important uh, moving forward. Now we need your help uh, because. There are still a lot of questions to be answered, and we need all of you to help, uh, you know, kick the tires, so to speak, uh, and vet the model so that we can fix things like what Dean just mentioned around the uh, the competitor slash coach issue, uh, so that by the time we get to members assembly, we have a fully baked uh, idea, and that the members will have a fully baked idea to vote on. So uh, we appreciate your uh, your feedback. Please keep it coming and uh, look forward to your questions. 
I will add that the main focus of this town hall will be this membership model plan, but um, if there are other issues, you're certainly welcome to share those as well here. But uh, let's start by keeping the focus on on the membership model. Jenna Bercheski's on to moderate. So I think if uh, I can't see everybody, Jenna, so if somebody has a question and their hand goes up, just let me know. I will turn on the chat here as well. I see it Sean like Franey has a question. Yeah. Hey, Sean, go ahead. Sean Franey from Colorado. How are you, Sean? Hey, Dean. Uh, thanks for addressing the coach competitor issue right off the bat. I think that was the only one where looking at it, there seemed to be almost a conflict between two memberships where, and it seemed administratively that you, if you were required to have two, it could get messy on the back end. Um, so just to clarify, your recommendation is doing the upgrade to coach that would then cover the benefits of competitor moving forward, right? Yeah, so I think you can imagine that upgrade from the basic membership to the $100 coach slash competitor. Um, the only thing I am going to say is that we are introducing a code certification process and people will have to complete that to get some of the other benefits of the coach, but there won't be, you know, it's it will essentially be one membership. So uh, a competitor, in other words, paying $100 can't coach without competing, completing those coach certification requirements. They're not going to be onerous, but I think they're overdue. Uh, and also, we're going to add some educational programming for coaches that that coach membership will give you access to. Does that answer uh, your question? Yeah, no, that does. And, and I agree with the certification. I think that's fantastic. So thank you. I see Jim has his hand up, I think. In order, Stefan would be before me. All right, Stefan, or I'll, I'll, I'll let Jenna cue it up. How's that? Because I, I can't see enough on my screen. So whoever is next. I think Stefan can go ahead. All right. Hi, Stefan. I hope you can hear me. Uh, you're a little low. I can't quite hear you, but. Is uh, that any better? That's better for me. Yes, okay. thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, I also would like to say thank you for addressing the uh, coaches and competitors thing. That was the first question on our list. Um, a big one that we noticed was um, there are two representatives who are going to be able to have a meeting with uh, a member of USA Curling Leadership every month. It's gonna, it says it's going to be a male member and a female member. Um, in the interest of keeping curling an inclusive sport, I think that that ought to be changed to two members of different gender identities for those who are non-binary. Yeah, Stefan, I, I had that feedback uh, in an email from Laura Yee as well and appreciate it. Uh, and I will make that change. I mean, in our effort to promote gender equity, that's why we're, we said one male and one female, but I can understand that. Um, so I think you can expect to see that change. Wonderful. Thank you. It looks like we have a question in the chat around college students. Are you able to see the chat, Dean? Yeah, hang on one sec, Jen. I'll bump, jump into that. Um, yeah, so hi, Kelly. On the college students, I will say we're meeting. We had Aaron Kaler and I had a uh, pretty productive meeting with Nancy Myers and Sam Futch, who are on the College Curling Board. And we talked about a number of things, including membership and uh, what that would look like. Uh, for years, the college students have had a membership where they paid $34 plus an additional $20 to fund the national championship. That's different than our other national championships where the people who participate in the national championships pay an additional fee. So we are working with uh, Nancy and Sam uh, on sorting through a different, uh, how that will work with college. Uh, and that's why there's not a civic college membership in here. Um, but um, as soon as we get back with them, uh, collaborate with them some more, um, we'll have more information on that. It looks like the next hand is gonna be Jim. Hi, Jim. Hello. Um, thanks for all the work. I know everybody's worked hard on this, and I really appreciate that some thought was put into an obvious 
gap in what we currently had. Um, I have uh, two quick ones. One is on the legal side during the frequently asked questions portion. I did note that the uh, membership term is going to be a hard start and stop on November 30th, December 1st. Uh, and I was wondering if anybody had reviewed the case, um, the litigation regarding Costco and their membership program, which also had a hard stop date up until a class action sued them for uh, lost value uh, due to the short term of members joining throughout the year and not getting an equal value to their, uh, their payment. Um, so it's something to maybe look at uh, and then the second question I really have is, I understand that in the, um, again, in the frequently asked questions section, it did indicate that most clubs should be paying less per year as a total, which does sound wonderful. Um, although when we've done some of the, the quick math on the numbers that were presented, we are a five sheet club with roughly 270 current members. Um, which actually, if we base it with the $5 discount per active member and uh, the new fee structure, we'll be paying close to $2,500 more per year in order to remain fully uh, members of USA Curling. And I'm wondering um, if there's something that re-incentivizes clubs to build more sheets uh, rather than just a uh, a price that would be exclusive to or exclusionary to the more sheets you build, the more expensive it gets to curl. Um, or if there's a way that uh, potentially as you grow into the larger membership, we could see additional discounts for bringing more people to the organization. Well, well let me tackle the Costco question first. Um, I, I, I'll admit that I wasn't aware of that. Um, we did follow, we did use a hard stop. Uh, hard start, hard stop formula that other NGBs use, like USA Hockey. So uh, we'll look into that though, um, and and see what the ramifications of that are. Now, in in terms of your question about your club, there are a few clubs uh, that exist as outliers. I think we did note that in the in the FAQ, and we will work with you directly uh, to find a solution that means you won't be paying more. Uh, we don't want to penalize clubs you know, like yours that have five sheets and are relatively new. There are also clubs, for instance, in uh, more rural areas where they have large facilities that we certainly appreciate because we use them often for national championships, uh, but they're in smaller communities and they may have smaller memberships as well. We did discuss, the board uh, discussed and, and staff discussed having some sort of guardrails or hard stops on certain things, uh, but we elected to, because the number of outliers isn't significant, that we will work with you directly. We don't want to penalize a club like yours, so we will work with you directly to ensure that you're not suddenly paying $2,500 more. Now, the 20, now also I, I should add that, you know, all our, all our models are based, for instance, on when we modeled number of sheets, we're saying, we based most of that modeling on every one of your existing members also being an individual member. So, um, you know, it, when we did optimal numbers per sheet, for instance, uh, a two sheet club that had 108 members uh, under this new model would pay $12 less if all their members became USA Curling members again. Um, and we broke it down, you know, by virtually every size of club. So there are a few outliers. Um, most of them fall on the spectrum of, of larger facilities with more sheets. Now, sheets might seem like maybe not the best way to scale, but it's the, it's, it is a natural way to scale. Number of sheets usually equates to number of members by and large, so that's why we went with that approach. But um, trust that we won't be, you know, we will monitor that to make sure that your club isn't suddenly paying more than you were in the past. Does that answer your question? The Costco litigation is just another thing to keep me awake at night, but we will look into that. I believe that does, thank you. All right, thank you, Jim. Sean Franny is gonna be the next hand up. 
Hey, Sean. Sorry, I've got a list, so I figured I would just cycle through. Um, sure. I, for, for this one, and, and it's good following Jim's question and, and your explanation just now, um, just so I'm understanding it correctly, the way we read it is the clubs pay a club membership, which is based on the number of sheets with the modifications that you, you referenced just now. And then each individual member also is responsible for an individual membership. Is that, is that understanding correct? Yeah, so, but there, I think the key point to, to make there is, is how collection can happen. There are some clubs uh, that have expressed a desire to continue to collect USA Curling membership as part of their dues structure. So they'll submit that with their club membership fees um, rather than have people go out and individually purchase membership. Clubs may elect to have, uh, you know, every individual member want to just sign up themselves. And then at the end of the year, we'll look at how many individuals they have and apply that rebate. Um, so those are sort of the two basic ways it can happen. Um, we're trying to be flexible enough for clubs that do want to collect as they have in the past and submit rosters and then also accommodate clubs that want to pay a club membership fee and not collect individual memberships. Does that make okay. sense? Yes, no, that, that does make sense. Um, so one kind of, I guess, question we had is, um, if, if everybody at the club is a basic member, it's pretty straightforward. Um, obviously now with the different tiers and the fact that members are basically electing into these upgrades. Um, one of the things that we were thinking about is if, if a member wants to upgrade, how would USCA curling? And I, and I asked this genuinely because I want to know administratively, what, what do we recommend to our club boards? Um, is it better if basically everybody starts at a basic membership and then treats it? like an upgrade to something else um or is it is it better that you you buy the membership that you desire and i guess from that perspective the way the way the press re release read it was kind of like you wouldn't buy the basic membership and upgrade if you wanted you could just what you would do is you just buy the competitive membership or buy the gold membership um is there is there a preference from usca administratively in terms of how that's handled um, because that would determine maybe how some of these clubs facilitate the not only the accounting on their side, but the collection and transfer of money as well. Sure. So I, I think on the accounting side for a club, obviously, probably the easiest way to do it will be just to collect, if they're going to collect those dues, collect the basic membership and then have members upgrade on the MyUSA Curling Sport 80 platform. Right now, there are also some clubs, quite frankly, have spoken to us about wanting to be able to collect all tiers of membership. So if a club wants to do that, we're certainly going to work with them uh, to make that possible. But the the I'm going to guess that on the accounting side for most clubs, the easiest would be to collect the basic membership and have individual members uh, upgrade on their own. And 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 I'll add that if you even if you buy a basic membership uh, yourself online through the platform, you can upgrade at any time. Right? You can still always go in and upgrade. Did that answer that? Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. And understanding that from your side, you can work with either. Um, I think yes. that was just my my question was if if you had a preference on what was easier administratively, that kind of gives us some direction when we talk to club boards. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'll be I'll be frank. I mean, if if a club wants to collect all the memberships and submit submit those those funds will probably be thrilled with that but i can certainly understand why some clubs may just want to collect the basic membership so um you know somebody in the chat asked wouldn't it cost more to buy basic and competitive later no uh it will be an upgrade so if you pay you have a 25 dollars basic membership uh, and you want to upgrade you'll be charged 75 dollars to move to the 100 dollars membership or if you want to move to supporter membership you'd be charged an extra 25 dollars for example John Gillespie asked, so we collect the $25 and then they upgrade to competitive by paying additional $75. I'm going to guess, John, for most clubs, as I just said to Sean, that's probably the easiest way for a club to handle it. Again, certainly willing to work with clubs that want to collect all tiers of membership.
The next person with their hand up is Gina. Hi, Gina. Hey, uh, hey, Dean. Hey, Brett. Hey, everyone. Thanks Gina for doing from, this. From from Seattle. How are you? I'm good. Yes. So yes, I'm from Seattle, and I am the president of the Pacific Northwest Curling Association. And so I have a number of questions related to the role of regions under this new model. So it sure. looks like there are some changes related to you know how voting at the members assembly works, removing those votes to clubs or to individuals. And um, that was one. The other is that it mentioned dropping the 95% rule. So what I'd like to know is, do regions no longer need to require USCA membership of our clubs? How, what, is, what does it mean to be a region under this new model? Are we kind of separating from USCA? Are we still, what are the compliance rules there? And then we're, you know, we're at least running playdowns this year is the plan to eventually move away from region-based playdowns and for, at least for the current year if someone is not a member of a club but is able to participate how do we decide what region they play down with um and one more to add on to the list is is the plan then to eventually move away from region elected directors because i'm wondering how you do the accounting if if curlers don't have to be members of you know a club they could just be individual members how do we keep track of who's in what region or is that just going to be going away so a lot well, a lot I, to break I, down there i know <laughs> yeah so let me let me try to work backwards uh, i don't think first of all we support strong regional associations we we believe that regional associations are key it's a big reason why we're populating the board the same way with directors from regions um, and it's another reason why we didn't move to a sectional playdown structure. Um, now, there may be a time when we alter playdown structure, but I think regional associations will always be involved in those. Uh, we are eliminating the need for a region to enforce compliance, um, which I, I'm quite sure no region is going to be too upset about. Um, so we're not requiring regions to enforce compliance. Now, when it comes to something like a regional playdown, um, I think the region has every right, of course, to demand that you belong to the region that you're playing down in. So I think that would resolve that issue on its own. If you're, if it's the Pacific Northwest Club Nationals playdown, uh, I think you obviously have to be a member of the Pacific Northwest region in order to to play in it. Um, now, what we are so are, and then on the, so I, I think I've tackled at least three. Do you want to? Was there one I missed there though? Um. Yeah, the one at the end was so currently uh, there are several members of the USCA board who are le elected by the regions. And I'm just yep. wondering, like, how the the counting works then, because, you know, that allocation is based on how many members your region has and how we're going to be tracking. Like if you have USCA individual members who are members of a curling club that's not a USCA member club and then they are part of a region like. How how is that allocation going to work going forward? Is the plan to keep that board structure the same, or are there plans to eventually move away from that? Because it seems like the accounting gets complicated. I don't know if anyone's thought through that. I'm going to maybe let Brett. He's nodding his head if he wants to jump in here, but uh, I have some thoughts too. But I'll let Brett share his first. Yeah. So we'll we will be counting votes in a region based on how many people sign up from that region which means they will have to be members of the usca and a member of the region in order to count towards the determining how many um how many determining board allocation has in order to be grouped yeah. with you know in your case grouped with other regions right because the three largest regions each have an, a board member individually, and then the other three board members are split amongst multiple regions, as as my uh, board spot is. Uh, mine's split between the GLCA and, and Midwest Curling Association. So, uh, how the the those other three will be allocated, and and how regions would be grouped together, will be based on the census of how many people have joined the USDA from that region. The, the um, who is a member of the region has more to do with 
who you guys say is a member of your region than it does so, what we say. So would the expectation then be that the region provides you a roster of our members? Or like like I'm wondering how to club. handle the situation if you have a if you have a club in a region that decides not to be a USCA member club, but then they might have curlers who decide to become individual USCA members and they want to, you know, participate in region events and USCA events. How do we account for those people? Because their clubs wouldn't be reporting anything to you because they're not USCA member clubs. So I, I would expect the region to then submit those numbers to us, right? So um, I, I understand your point. I I, I think that, um, you know, so what you're saying is there could be a club that, I mean, if a club doesn't join either, your question is, so so where do we count those individual members? Is that sort of the crux of it? Yeah. So let's say they don't yeah. join a region. Yeah. So yeah, but like if they I want think to join a region, count like how does that, yeah, counting work <laughs> yeah I think or, or if they don't know, join a region then what yeah how does that work i i guess that's it's really comes down to like for those individual members who might not be a member of a member club how do they fit in with the region model that's a, it's a it's a good point uh good point of discussion i think it's easily resolved though i mean most uh i guess the reality is you're talking about an individual member at a club that doesn't join USA Curling, but participates in regional events, I would think that the region would be able to capture that individual membership and 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 show that. I, I'm not exactly sure how that how that person would slip through everything unless they didn't unless they didn't join the region or compete in any regional events. Yeah, well, I, I it comes, I guess more to the the governance side of things is so i don't want to go too far into this i want to make sure other people have a chance to ask questions but like the scenario i'm envisioning is suppose in my region a club decides that they no longer want to be a usca member club but they have individual curlers who decide so they'll still be a member of the region but not of the usca and then individual yeah. curlers decide we want to get our basic membership because we want to support USCA. So maybe they're not competing in events, but they're USCA members. And so that should count towards if we're still following model of like how many members in a region affects governance. We want to make sure those num those people count as part of our region. I'm I want to know if it's on the region on me as a region leader to track those numbers and provide them to you or if you have some other way you're planning to keep track of that so rather than i think it's a good point i think there's a way to manage this pretty easily um but i think i'm going to add it to my list of things to provide clarity on i don't think it's a it's a huge challenge i think there's a way to do it we want to track people or individual members um i think it's going to come down to whether they're also a member of the region all right, yeah, we can talk more about this. I just kind of wanted to plant the yeah. seed of these are this is where no, my mind a, is going. A, so I'd love to follow up more. It's a fair point. Um, you know, we are going to ask uh, individual members to denote their member club when they when they join, if they join individually, right? So that uh, that will give us one barometer, but we could probably also ask for regional membership at the same time, but the regional membership would go through you. Um, mm -hmm. I think we can work it out, Gina. I think it's a good point you bring up and uh, part of the reason we're doing this. Great, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next hand up is Sonia. Yeah, I'm just gonna quickly, uh, uh, Lisa said, could we have a meeting in the near future for regional leadership to discuss some of these issues? Absolutely, Lisa. Um, I That's on me that I didn't put that out when the, when we announced these details that we would be meeting with regional leadership to, to work through these things. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that's on the agenda for us. Sonia is next. Hey, Dean. Um, hey, everyone. Hi, Sonia. Hey, so I wanna begin by thanking Gina because she asked probably about three or four of the questions, the same ones that I had, and that probably the same ones that other region people have right now too. But, um, and I don't know, let me know if this is redundant. My question is actually about mixed 
um, championships and mixed nationals because um, I saw that it actually wasn't one of those that a person has to be a club member of, um, or sorry, excuse me, that the club doesn't have to be USA, USCA member of, because uh, that's arenas and club uh, nationals. But um, like for, as a region, we uh, do fairly large mixed play downs. And so I'm just wondering how that would work. And maybe that just funnels into the same question that Gina just asked, but um, that is kind of confusing for us right now as to how we would, would we host a mixed play down? What if somebody that, that isn't from a, um, their club isn't USCA uh, club, but their members are, or if the club is from USCA, but it, they bring a couple of uh, teams where maybe there's somebody who is from uh, a, a club that isn't a USCA club in that team, you know, just how would that work? Well, I, I think the region, we probably fall back to the original region rules where you had to be a member of a club with at least two members of a mixed team had to be members of a club within that region. We have had sort of mixed teams in region, people from different regions. That's one reason why we didn't insist on club membership. Um, but I, Again, I think that there's a relatively easy way to resolve that, but I can understand that question. Um, I, I think that, you know, regions can certainly require uh, regional membership, right, to compete in a regional play down. So uh, I think that that's one element. Um, and I would hope that, you know, curlers would want to join their regional associations to do that. Um, but both good points um, and things that, that, we'll try to address to eliminate any confusion and bring up in our meeting with uh, regional leadership. I mean, the, the reality is the last thing we wanna do is we, we wanna encourage these regional playdowns for one thing, we think they're valuable. Um, having, having members of a team that competes in club nationals and arena club nationals be a member of a USA curling club makes sense because quite honestly, we, we, we want that to be a celebration of our club culture and everything else. Um, on mixed and U 18s, we have traditionally had teams that have not been from the same club. So I, I think we do need to address that and figure out how to make that work. I, I don't think it's, it's impossible. I just, I, I, I think it's a good point you bring up. Yeah, thank you, Dean. And uh, we'll look forward to the meetings with regions because, um, we, again, we don't want to hog everybody's time, but we have definitely have a long list of them. Okay, I, I we look forward to that meeting. I think we can resolve it together. I want regions to know that we want to encourage regional association membership, certainly not diminish it. It's valuable to us. It's valuable to the sport. So uh, we'll figure out a way to make that work. Um, I do see a question here. Uh, insurance, how is US from Joe Calabrese, has insurance changed and now allow club-based coverage not based on the club's membership number? For example, under this member model, a club could join the club member with a small fraction of their member. Well, our, our thought, Joe, and we're reviewing all our insurance coverage right now to make sure we have the best possible solutions. Um, but I think basically we'll be offering clubs uh, with the club membership will come insurance for the club. Personal liability insurance will be with the individual. Uh, we are currently working with a number of insurance providers to see both consolidate some of our coverages and make sure we have the best possible solution for our members and member clubs. Um, I think somebody's got a, might have their volume on in the background. That's just getting a little bit of a reverb. Um, is it possible for a member, a person to be a member of a curling club that decides to pay their own membership in USA Curling to join as a member of the Great Lakes region, even though their club is in Wisconsin? Um, we're, like I said, we're going to have to think about that one. That's uh, not mental gymnastics. I was, I was thinking about it that, right now, but uh, I think we can sort that out. Um, Phil has a question about member registration from previous question. Do we have a preference for clubs registering as an entire club or having members sign up individually or are you agnostic? Um, 
I guess, you know, you could say we're agnostic, Phil. I mean, it's up to the club how they want to do that. Obviously, we love the idea of clubs enrolling their membership with USA Curling. That's obviously beneficial to us. So, uh, and I think that that would, you know, that certainly allows you, allows us to recognize that rebate uh, quickly. So there's advantages to clubs that sign up that way. But clubs don't have to do that. another hand up jenna yep it looks like the next hand that we have is mike from nutmeg hi mike How are you doing? good evening dean good evening everybody might have one other you might have something else on in the background maybe. yeah two devices on i'm gonna put my hand down i, I don't, i'm not gonna have people listen to this thanks all right, thanks, Mike. Sorry about that. Looks like the next hand up is Christopher. Mike, can you put your question in the chat? Go ahead, Christopher. Hey, um, so I'm I'm the club secretary at my club, and I just had some maybe more technical questions about the transition. So, so first question was just. If if this new model is approved at the the upcoming members assembly, does that this new membership turn start on December first, twenty twenty three, or December first, twenty twenty four? So, December first, twenty twenty three, I I think is the answer. It, you will join as the new membership will start. Then uh, it'll wrap around till November thirtieth of the following year. So. It's a little right. bit like the model that, say, USA Hockey uses, where they use September 1st as a start and it wraps around till August 31st. Uh, the reason we're electing to go with December 1st is related to some of the questions about whether a club collects the membership or, or not. And a lot of clubs, for a lot of clubs, that'll be easier on December 1st than on September 1st. Right. So, so I think I, that's what I expected. I, I think my follow up question has to do with the first the first year like like as this is implemented so i, I understand mm -hmm. that the current current membership term is runs technically from july through june so with this changing there's going to be this five month period from july through november um is that counted as a a full term in terms of dues are we going to have to pay our dues for that five month period or or how exactly is this transition going to work on on that level so it's it's a good question and one we discussed internally today. So if somebody joins, say now, uh, because our fiscal year ended June 30th, uh, under the $34 model, we'll fold that in on December 1 um, and wrap it around till November 30th of the following year. And then they'll switch to the, then they'll move on with the, with the basic membership. Okay, so we can our our club. We're probably going to continue collecting USA curling dues from our members yep. and then submitting to you. So can we tell our members that they will have USA curling membership from now through November of twenty four? Correct. So okay. we're gonna we're gonna fold them in. What club are you with? Sorry, I, I mean I uh, missed it. Hollywood Hollywood curling. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So, I mean, and it's it's. Uh, you know, a lot of arena clubs are in this situation where they're curling right now and collecting membership. So for those clubs, we're going to wrap that around. So until the following year. OK, thanks. I, I think last comment, it, it might help to have some kind of examples that you can document of, of common scenarios like this in, in your. Sure, um, that's a good idea. Yeah, because I'm sure other club secretaries will, will appreciate that as well. Yeah. Jenna, can we bump Mike DiPolo up to number one because he was he had already been waiting patiently? We can absolutely do that. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. I think I had two browsers with the meeting on. That was what was causing it. In any event, yeah, uh, a couple of very quick questions. I'll give them to you one at a time so uh, we can get a, 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 a solid answer to each. Number one, um, our regional association is still going to be considered members of USA Curling under the bylaws. The bylaws have to be revised, um, and 
so that that hasn't happened yet. But with member clubs carrying the votes, I think that there will be a different structure. Regions are obviously going to continue to populate the board of directors, but that will be part of the bylaw revisions. Okay. That leads to the second question is, will we see the bylaw revisions before the members assembly? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, the other thing, uh, and, and this again relates to the members assembly. Um, if you have a scenario where uh, uh, members sign up on their own, whether the club decides to or not join as a USCA member, curlers sign up on their own. And let's say you've got 150 curlers in your club who do this. The club mm -hmm. then decides not to join USA Curling. All these members are now individual members of USA Curling, though the club is not. How are you going to run the members assembly with maybe thousands and thousands of curlers who have a vote, but can't vote under their club? And so, yeah, so and and if in, in our part of the country, our region is currently not a USCA member either. So now you may have a you know a couple thousand curlers who have a vote at the meeting. How are you going to run that? So so that would be an issue for the October 2024 members assembly, obviously not this upcoming one. Uh, I don't think it's impossible to do that, to have individual okay. members vote. Um, certainly there's technology that can make that make that work for us. So um, yeah, we don't want another four and a half hour members assembly if that's what oh. you're getting at. But um, I, I think there's certainly a way to get around that and it doesn't affect this upcoming members assembly. So. Uh, of all the things we we're trying to work on, we don't have to resolve it for this upcoming members assembly, which will be under the old formula. So if I understand it correctly, then if we come to this October members assembly, we as clubs who are members of USCA, we are carrying the votes of the number of members who are on your roster from our club as of today and yep. through October. Yes, exactly. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just want to make sure because I, you know, I, we've got people who need to take care of this when we start collecting dues in another two sure. months. And, you know, if we start collecting dues with the idea that we're having members pay their $25 to us. And for whatever reason, I'm not just talking about nutmeg in particular, but any club who does this then decides for whatever reason not to join USA Curling, they've got 25 member or $25 in their account that really belongs to you, right? Because it's being funneled through our club on behalf of USA Curling. And so we're going to yeah. have to send that check to you either way, whether we decide to join USA Curling or not, correct? I would say that's correct. Yeah. Okay. If, you're, if you decide not to join as a club, then you wouldn't send us the club fees. You would just send us well, your individual member, member dues if you collect. And you would take care of yeah. the rostering of those individuals. I just want to think that. Yeah, that's not an people. ideal scenario, to be honest. But yeah, that's yeah. that's that's no, it's yeah, not. That's why I'm asking the question because I think there's a lot of logistics here that you know various clubs are going to make their own decisions based on whatever their club needs are. And I, I, I just want to make sure that you guys are aware of the fact that it's going to be a mishmash for a little while. Totally understood. I mean, this is a, you know, a significant change, right? So right. I imagine there are going to be some significant challenges on that. I, I do think, you know, one of the reasons we're offering uh, member clubs this $5 rebate on individual memberships yeah. is to incentivize them, right? So yeah, and I um, think that's yeah there will definitely be right. some challenges um, yeah. that, uh, you know, we'll all need a bit of patience and understanding to work through. Okay. Is there, is Jenna, uh, the Bercheski, the woman who we would as club presidents or club treasurers have to uh, talk with in order to make sure that our club members are protected, whether they're, and whether our club is a member of USA curling or not. Yeah. I'm not going to put it all on Jenna because she has a lot of responsibilities already. Okay. Um, all but right. yeah, and we, we actually have made another hire in member services as well. Okay. Um, anticipating uh, the need to work through some of these things. So okay. um, Jenna will certainly be involved. I'm involved. Um, so yeah, we, uh, I'm, I'm confident we can work through those challenges. Um, you know, so, so my, yeah. 
My aim here is to make sure that no matter what my board or our board decides to do, that our members are protected with, with you folks if, if our members want to be members of, of USA Curling, even if the club does not. Yes, yeah, so, and I, I appreciate that, and I'm sure your members appreciate that as well. So what you're saying is a member club collecting dues or a non-member club collecting USA Curling dues, which is right. – probably unlikely going forward. I would imagine that a club that elects not to be a member club probably wouldn't collect dues, but um, thrilled if you want to do that and, 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 and send those funds our way. But um, I can, I can understand that, that there might be a bit of a bit of confusion in year one here. Um, is there another hand up? I see. Let me see who's next. John. Right, the next one is uh, Stefan. Hi, Stefan. Again. Hi there. Another question for you. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a two part sure. question. So, um, what financial models does USCA, uh, USCA have that shows that this is going to be successful, that the membership numbers are going to remain high enough? Um, that this will result in the same, at least the same income for USA Curling, but also um, how, uh, I guess, were regional finances taken into account um, in these models too? I guess the pessimist in me is seeing a drop in membership now that members like, or people will not be required to be USCA members to be members of their club and region. Yeah, I, I mean, I will say that we share that cautious outlook um, and we have done our projections based on on a on not having as many members, um, you know, so we've done all our projections based pretty conservatively on overall membership numbers to get to a number that we think is viable for us to operate successfully. So, again, share your caution. Um, we're into new territory here. I will say that. I have been and staff has been as we work through these models and work through them with the board, we've been really conservative and, and on the expense side, we're continuing to keep the expense side as low as we can until we get a sense of, of what this membership looks like. It's not lost on us that, that we're going to have to earn every membership, right? So we plan to do that, but we're also not going to be uh, Pollyannish and uh, think that it's going to be um, you know, easy to do that. So we are actually projecting lower overall membership and working towards um, working towards exceeding those go exceeding those projections. Are those models something that could be made available to regional leadership? Yeah, we can share those with regional leaders in terms of the overall number of me members. Cool. Thank you. Next hand up is Sean Franny. Hey, Sean. Sorry. Were, uh, you, were, were you on the call earlier, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> Collecting a list here. Um, and I, I, uh, so I thank you for addressing one about kind of the implementation of 23 to 24, because that was one of the questions. Um, and having, I think, having the, the quote unquote free year rollovers makes a lot of sense. Um, one question I had, and this, this might help address some, one of Sonia's questions about mixed, is just the clarification, this is specifically for the competitor membership. My understanding from reading it is anybody who participates in a national championship will be required to have a competitor membership. In addition to that, the, the timing, from a timing perspective, um, not only we have to have it prior to competing in the championship itself, but for any intent to compete championships, which I think at this point include men's, women's, mixed doubles, and U21s, uh, in addition yep. to, I don't know, wheelchairs there yet, but potentially those as well. Um, my understanding is then that uh, those, um, those championships would require the competitor membership prior to competing in the qualifiers for those. Is that correct? That's correct. And also regional playdowns, you'll need to have a competitor membership. With that, though, I will add that we're uh, reducing the regional playdown fee structure significantly. So we used to charge $150 per player for those regional playdowns, which was a vestige of the old approach to national championships. So we're going to reduce that to 25 
basically some administrative costs on our side. Um, and but you will be required to have a competitor membership in that as well in those regional playdowns. Got it. Okay, so so you, in order to participate in a regional playdown, you will also need a competitor membership, not just necessarily the team that wins the regional playdown would then have to upgrade. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, well, thank but you. I, I just want to make clear that we are really knocking down those those uh, regional playdown fees by one hundred and twenty five dollars per person. And then if you think that the difference between a basic member, uh, $34 and $166, so significantly less to compete in a regional playdown, plus that competitor membership would go across any championship or playdown you're, you're in, right? So it's a one-time fee versus paying for each playdown. Correct. Yeah. Oh, no. Financially, this is, this is much lower cost for competitors, and I, I, I recognize that. I just... One of the questions we got is like for the team that, and just theoretically, the team that plays down, say for experience, but not necessarily expecting to win, do they need the competitor yep. membership? And now we can we can effectively tell them, yes. Now it's not hard to do the math and figure that just for one championship, you're going for $184 to $125. Like that's 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 much easier to to understand right there. And then obviously it compounds if you do additional championship playdowns. I just want right. to clarify right. that all teams that sign up and register for those playdowns. And the reason I ask is obviously it, it won't matter timing wise. It wouldn't matter for this year's arena national championship, but obviously go, look, going forward, those are kind of the first playdowns that typically happen based on the national championship being so early in the season. And because of that, we need to make sure to accommodate that. Huh? Fair enough. Yeah. I'll um, answer. There's a question from Joe. He says uh, in the FEQ about this meeting, the question about a GNCC board member being able to return to the board stage. The GNCC is invited to the return of a director on the board. Um, when we say their leadership, Joe, I, I mean the US, the uh, GNCC leadership. Um, and I have exchanged emails with Bob Hogan at the GNCC. Um, obviously, it would have to wait until after this new model, et cetera, is, is ratified at the uh, at the members assembly, but um, our 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 idea is that uh, we would hope they would return. Looks like the next hand in the queue is Mike Russell. Mike Russell, I don't know if I've met you, Mike. So where are you from? I'm from Triangle. Nice to meet you, Dean. Thanks for all the work. Oh, hey, Mike. Maybe I have met you then. I don't. I don't think we have actually. Anyway. Um, OK, all right. a, another membership question specifically around a, 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 maybe a little bit of an edge case scenario. Uh, just some clarification on what what is required. What? OK, our, we're hosting one of the outreach um, clinics um, next year. Yep. Does that mean that yep. everyone that attends that clinic has to have a basic USA curling membership? Not for the athlete outreach initiative. Now you have to be a member club to take advantage of that program. Right. Um, but but uh, you wouldn't all have to be USA Curling members to participate in that. Um, you would have to be a USA Curling member to take uh, any instruction courses or coaching courses, et cetera, that, that we offer. But the athlete outreach, oh, <laughs> Jenna's just saying, yes, you do. So for a clinic, yes, if we do do a clinic, sorry. I just mean, my, my thought is, my my answer is more rated around the idea that yeah, if you have some of that, some of the athlete and outreach and outreach initiative uh, is related to things like community outreach. So we, you know, some of it might be having a day where high school kids can come in and play during that athlete outreach initiative. But to sign up for a clinic, uh, and I apologize for for creating confusion there. To sign up for a clinic that goes through us, um, and that would require USA Curling individual membership. Okay. Thanks. Next hand up is going to be John. All right. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, hey, John. Hey, how are you? So, just wanted to clarify on the option for individuals to register with USA Curling, uh, selecting a primary club. Um, one thing we'd seen, um, you know, at, I think this past year, when we submitted our roster and I logged into 
check our roster. I, I saw at least a few names in there who I we had never heard from. Like, we didn't know who these people were that listed us as a primary club. And one or two who had been members maybe multiple years ago and haven't been back. Um, it, so I, I see that, like, all clubs are available for somebody selected as a primary club. But I'm trying to wrap my head around if there is any downside to that, if that's something that needs to be addressed at all, but or really... I'm I'm not even sure where that would really come into play. You know, oh, a person shows up at the club. Well, you, yes, I joined your club. Well, no, you didn't. You joined USA Curling. You just had to put a club, but you have to join us. We have our own club membership dues reduced by $25 because I see you already joined USA Curling. But I'm, I'm not really sure how that may or may not come into play. Yeah, I, I don't know how common that is. I have heard of that a little bit where somebody signs up with us and put lists a member club and the, the club doesn't have them as a member. Um, I think it can probably be resolved on because the numbers of that aren't significant. It would actually be to the club's advantage, I guess, because your club fee would be reduced by that membership, uh, whether they are a whether they're a member of your club or not, we could certainly put something in uh, in the platform to ensure that people aren't confused uh, that they're also joining uh, that they're not joining they're not a member of that club just by denoting that that you know they had they're selecting a home club. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how many members that was for you, John. Um, how many names you saw like that? I feel I like mean, it might have been like three or four i i don't remember offhand i'd have to yeah. look back it was it was not huge but it was enough it was like oh is this going to be a pattern i'm not sure did did any of them show up at your door wanting to curl or were they just were they just members and named you as their member club um nope um i'm not sure i don't know if any were a misclick or an error or a coding you know in a spreadsheet i know at least one who had been a member of the club you know years ago but they haven't been curling with us. I'm not sure if they've curled like other events where they had to list a home club or something. And we're like, we love them, yeah. but they haven't been with us in years. And I don't know if that impacts them yeah, at all. I, th I think we, you know, we can certainly have an auditing process when we yeah. review, okay, these are the people who listed you as a member of club. Um, like I said, it will be to a club's advantage to have a few of those. It'll reduce your club fee. But uh, I think both USA curling and member clubs will, be transparent about it. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Next hand up is uh, John Galipsy. No, I think he, John Gillespie, that was just John now. John was. Oh, sorry. I John thought there just were asked that question. No, he maybe he's, he might have Different two things. John, sorry about that. Two everybody. devices. Okay, next so would be so then it looks John like we you're muted, sir. So maybe we go to Emma and then come back. Sure. Um, Hi, Emma. Thanks. For, hey, Dane. Atlanta, um, how are you? I'm good. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit confused because it's kind of been a little back and forth, it seems. Um, for clubs that are planning, like arena clubs that are planning to do their, like start their dues collection with the next season that starts in August or September for them, do they need to plan yep. to budget those numbers based off of like the $34 mark that we were doing up until this year? Or do we need to assume that this model is approved in October and we'll be paying under that model? No, I, I think to the to this earlier question, and like I said, it was something we just we talked about today internally. I uh -huh. think you collect under the, the current model, okay. um, the thirty-four dollar model, uh, and then those memberships would be folded in as if they start on December first, if this new model is incorporated. And then, so essentially, and then it would wrap around till the following November thirtieth. Um, so essentially, they'd be getting. A little extra value, but they'd also be paying nine dollars more, but they'd be getting more months. If that makes okay. sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I just I wanted to make sure that's what it actually was and I hadn't misinterpreted that. Thank you. Yeah. 
we don't want we don't want clubs to feel like they have to collect under a model that isn't improved isn't approved or fully baked in yet either so um continue yeah. to collect under the existing model but we will we won't suddenly then on december one come to you and say oh now you've got to you know now all these members owe again thank you thank you Looks like Sean Franey has his hand back up. Is that right? Is it really Sean Franey? <laughs> Who is done? You know, I know um, so I can joke with you. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I apologize to everybody else on the call who doesn't know me. Um, and those of you that do, actually. Uh, so on the on the wraparound model there, come to December 1st. Um, and again, yeah. I, I apologize that m most of these questions are geared towards coaches and competitor memberships and some of the advanced tiers in terms of upgrade and elections. Um, but if if we paid the $34 membership, because for example, I'm a member of Denver and DCC is doing their registration right now. Um, so we're paying yeah. that membership now. If I plan to compete in a national championship and or qualifying event between December 1st, 2023 and November, um, am, I, am I going to need to upgrade to a competitive membership or will the $34 be automatically like does it does it is it going to matter the tiers for this next year i guess is my question if they do matter am i going to have to upgrade and is the upgrade from the 34 dollar existing investment i'm going to say the latter the you will have to upgrade but uh we'll credit that 34 which will be a bit of an accounting headache at times but we'll upgrade from the 34 you pay to the 100 on december 1. okay Terry Dixon asked, why is the start end time of the membership model two months into the curling season? Wouldn't it be easier to have the date in the off season? Um, well, you know, Carrie, there's been a lot of discussion at board level and staff level about the uh, the dates for this. Um, and I'm not sure there's a perfect answer to be, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I don't know if there is the way, you know, we're hearing now, for instance, Denver Curling Club, which operates almost year round. We have arena clubs that operate in the summer. Um, in terms of whether there is an off season uh, in curling anymore, I'm not sure there really is. But so clubs are operating on different calendars. December one was chosen uh, because it gave uh, most the most dedicated ice clubs a chance to get started, uh, figure out their membership and their dues, and then submit them on December first versus the old date of January 31st, which really didn't make much sense. So that's why it was chosen. I'm not going to say there aren't arguments to be made for different dates but i think most of those arguments are offset by another argument on the other side so we had to settle on one date it seemed that that would be the most appropriate date to, uh, the most appropriate date to use um what if we receive dues using 34 dollars membership in september then in december have membership members that want their usa curling fee refunded well, we typically don't offer refunds, so I, I I don't know why suddenly in December suddenly would somebody would want their membership refunded when if they paid thirty four dollars in September it would wrap around until the following November thirtieth. Certainly something we'll take under consideration. Uh, Kelly asked that the twenty five dollar regional playdown model goes into effect this fall. It will go into effect on November one, considering if if this is ratified at the members assembly. Um, Carl says, don't collect the dues specifically as, I'm not exactly sure what your question is there, Carl. So if you wanna take another pass at writing it, great, or or just say something. Oh, that was an answer. Okay, great. I'll, I'll, I love answers, so we'll leave that one. Um, I'm just trying to see if I missed anything else in the chat here. Um, I think Jenna's jumped in here and answered a few questions about the ability to sign an admin. Uh, somebody's asking Jenna if there will be a transaction fee for individuals renewing their membership or upgrading their membership. I don't believe so, but. I don't believe there is one, um, but I would have to double check that. I don't that believe there is one now. Yeah. We don't currently have the option to upgrade a membership, so we just have to see what that looks like. Yeah. We have meetings with Sport 80 scheduled 
uh, which is our current platform for next, starting next week. Um, Stefan. Uh, Jim was ahead of me, so I let him go first. And I'll oh, go all right. We just keep running into this, Stefan. Um, <laughs> for a competitive junior, uh, will they be expected to pay the $100 membership to compete, or will there be the youth membership price or something in the middle that's more uh, equitable for young folks getting into the sports? Well, currently we're expecting the hundred dollars for all competitors and all champion or all championships or play downs and championships. Um, I understand that concern. I will say that if you have kids who play youth sports, I think you're going to find that curling is still an incredible value. So even at a hundred dollars um, for uh, a young player to play in a junior nationals or, or play down for that, I, I think that's still very reasonable. So at the moment, we don't have plans for a, a junior membership, uh, a junior competitor membership. And then also on the, the note of juniors, now that we've gone to more of an individual membership basis, uh, how will we represent the juniors equitably at the voting level for the General Assembly so that juniors' voices can be heard since all decisions will affect them and they won't have as much regional representation as they have in the past yeah right now junior members won't carry votes at the members assembly um you know so that's not something that uh we've done before i guess so certainly something we can look at um but i'm, I'm not sure we're inclined to have junior members as voters at the members assembly I will make a note of that question, though. I will note that our club recently changed bylaws to include everyone down to the age of 16 be eligible to vote so that they could be represented in matters that would impact them, hopefully, in their decades long curling career. Sure. Um, I can understand that sentiment for sure. Uh, I don't know who's next, whether it's Mike or Stefan. I think we have Stefan next. <laughs> All right, Stefan, go ahead. Thanks, Dean. All right, so this is a sort of tangentially on topic, but um, Mopac is currently staring at the most expensive playdown that we have ever uh, hosted in our region. And um, it's it's not a bad thing. You know, our, our facilities, our member clubs that are dedicated are providing a service that we obviously do need to pay for. And um, we don't have a problem paying that. However, um, I know that our regional president has been raising questions on how the member, or rather the competitive fees under the current model are being used, um, particularly as to why the regions get so little back. Um, we're we're trying to figure out how to pay for this. Um, under the new model, the same fee would certainly make that a lot more reasonable. Is there any possibility that the upcoming arena playdowns could utilize the new $25 per person um, fee structure as opposed to the current 150 with the small rebate to regions? Well, we did make the arena $100 a person um, earlier. Um, but uh, the, the challenge there is that some, uh, some playdowns have already occurred. That, that is one challenge. Now, going forward, it would certainly not be 150 or 100. It'll be 25. And then regions will can charge what they want to charge as a regional playdown fee. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, where are you guys having your arena playdown? At, uh, At SFBAC? Confirmed, but I believe it's San Francisco, yeah. Yeah, I can yeah. confirm that's what's probably oh, it is confirmed. Okay, thanks, Jim. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, we we have the same issue with the at-large arena club playdowns that we're hoping to have at Atlanta. I know Amazon here, and we're working through them. We're going to be it's going to be at their arena facility, and we'll be paying for that as well. So, um, you know, I understand that. All I can say really is that we are we did recognize the fact that. Um, the regional playdown fee structure was something that should have changed years ago. 
Um, I walked into the Wauwatosa Curling Club last year here in the Wisconsin Club Playdowns, and immediately people were talking to me about it and what, what people said made sense. Um, so, you know, the $25 that we're going to collect is a nominal amount just for managing the registrations. For people who don't know, what happens is people sign up for those regional playdowns through us, and we'll, and then we reconcile the regional fees at the end of the year with each region and return those fees. So um, we don't keep the regional association fees. When is your, um, when is your arena play down? Oh, I don't have that in front of me, but I'm sure Jim has that answer. <laughs> Early February. That's early february no oh, that's for, uh, I'm, uh, sorry for arena not for this I'm year for right now yeah 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 arena would that would be too late September. for this year it's okay. the end of last week of september september yeah well let's discuss that um you know i, I okay. think one of the challenge let's discuss your challenges with with paying san francisco which is certainly legitimate they have their own costs that they have to recover as well so um you know there's certainly a possibility for us there to work with you on that and like i said going forward i don't i hope this isn't an issue and i, and I understand why it was i mean it, it it wasn't the regional play down fee structure was not great thank you next hand up is going to be mike mike Okay, thank you. Uh, just a very a couple of very quick questions. What is the actual document that we'll be vo we'll be voting on at the members assembly? Is it the summary that you've already released, or are you going to be presenting another document? Uh, I see Brett nodding his head, so he could probably tackle that as as the chair. Um, and I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, there will be bylaws amendments that the membership will be voting on. And that, that's ultimately what the, the membership is voting on. I, I actually don't believe the membership will be voting on, yeah, $100 for competitive membership and, and all of those things. That, right. Those are administrative uh, things that we have the staff do. Uh, but the organizational structure, you know, getting rid of the 95% compliance rule, um, having tiered memberships, I mean, those are all things that are going to be built into the, the new bylaws that are the amendments to the bylaws. That the membership will vote on, and obviously you'll have you'll see those well ahead of time. Okay, that was that was part one uh, a. Uh, part uh, part two is I got the impression from something that Dean had indicated earlier that you would entertain the GNCC rejoining USA Curling after the members assembly. Uh, is that something you would not entertain before the members assembly? So the the. Prior to the members assembly, we're operating under the current bylaws, which require all the compliance problems that ended up okay. being the, the major sticking point between right. the region and the United States Curling Association. So unless the GNCC wants to comply with the current bylaws, it does not seem reasonable that they would join prior to the change. Right. Okay, I just wanted to be I just wanted that to be clear. Thank you. Nothing else. I will, I will repeat that. We've had outreach, uh, just so people on this call know. I, I, my last conversation with Bob Hogan, um, where we both left it, is we'll talk once there's a new membership model. So, you know, there really isn't a new membership model until these new bylaws and governance is approved on at the members assembly. That doesn't mean we won't talk before that. So, at this point, now that we have a new membership model plan. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Next hand raised is John Gillespie. Hey, John. Hi, John. Hopefully it works this time. No, oh, you're on. I, we, I can't hear you unless somebody else can. I can't hear him either. Coming back, he's going to try again. So we'll go to somebody else, Jenna. Well, John, I blame John, the heat in Philadelphia. Hey, John Dean, Baisley you, is next. Really quick, um, Dean. There was a question about when is the members assembly? Can you want to do you want to give an update about that? Yeah. So 
uh, we're hoping to have the members assembly October 13 to 15. Um, that's going to depend a little bit on the venue, but it will be in October. Uh, that's the first date we're looking at. Um, if it's not that date, it will be the weekend before or the weekend after. And it will be uh, in the Twin Cities, most likely at, uh, at the Viking Lake campus, uh, where our offices are. Um, that is generally our most cost-effective location. So that's why it would, would be there. And just to be clear, the, the members assembly as an event will be there. The members assembly meeting will be a hybrid meeting between in-person there and those that cannot make it will still be able to participate in the meeting and vote wherever they are. Is that correct? Yeah, we'll make the entire member. Yeah, we'll make the entire members assembly hybrid, right? So whether you're you can attend in person or you can attend virtually for both the voting um, and the um, and the and the programming around it. Okay. Next hand we have up is John Baisley. Hey, John. Hey, Alpine. How are you doing? Oh, yep. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for everything uh, you guys have all done for Alpine. Uh, I hope this is a pretty easy and quick question. Um, I am a member not only of Alpine, but also Madison. If I continue to do that and Madison continues to operate the way they do, which is to uh, pay dues for each member, but Alpine will likely want to pay individual dues. Who in the years past, if you paid dues, at, if you're a member of multiple clubs and you paid dues, um, you were getting both clubs didn't have to pay. So who gets the benefit of the five dollar reduction if you're a member of two clubs? Do both clubs get it or do you have to select one? It's going to be the latter. You're going to select your primary club. OK, and the member will select the primary club. So in clubs who choose to collect dues and pay the dues to USCA, if that member says, hey, wait a minute, I want my membership to go to a different club, they're going to have to negotiate that with the club. And yeah, I would I would think that. Yeah, OK, I think that's how it would work that they would you would say, hey, I want to I want to be a member of Alpine because that's where I want to be my primary club. So don't collect my USA curling member dues here and I'll take care of them myself and connect with Alpine. OK. OK, thank you. Appreciate it. No problem. And next up is Sean Franny. Hey, Sean. Hey, uh, again, this is more thank you to everybody again who, who chimed in for all of this um, and, and is kind of pushing things forward. The with with all of this um, kind of and we'll see what happens with the members assembly, but I think there's a good chance to to move forward and continue to grow the sport. Um, is there anything else that we can expect kind of on membership that's uh, aside from addressing the questions and working out the kinks? that's still being developed that we can expect in the future? Or is this kind of, we're, we're trying to put a bow on this issue now and move on to, to other issues and, and other areas of growth later? You know, I think the latter, Sean. Um, we'd love to get this membership model locked in and popular with people and figure out some of the uh, operational issues that have come up in this call in this past week um, and then move forward from there. I think, I think a new membership model you know, I, I'm not alone in this, but it was long overdue, right? I mean, I think anybody who's been involved with USA Curling in 2017, I said the old model wasn't sustainable. So we we found that out. We're moving to a new one uh, that is in line with what uh, many other NGBs do. Uh, we've thought about it quite a bit. I'm not going to, as we, as obvious from some of the conversation tonight, we don't have everything figured out exactly why we're introducing it now as a plan. And and work through some of these things. But um, yeah, I would hope that going forward, uh, this is the this is the model and we're focused on growing the game and and uh, getting everybody uh, you know on this on the same page and working together to grow the sport we love. No, perfect. Okay. And one more thank you um, to everybody who got the competitive schedule out early this year for dates and locations for all the things. 
um, that's making a huge difference for everybody planning this year. So thank you. I know, I know it was a push this year. I know it was a lot last year. So thank you. No problem. I will add on that, Sean, that uh, for anybody who's on this call, we are still, um, you know, we're really intent on trying to have every single national championship in 2024 settled by the end of June. Uh, we thought we had uh, spots for seniors and five and under nationals. Those are the two that we really need to find host sites for. So if anybody is with the club that thinks uh, there is interest there, um, ideally they're clubs that are on the larger size, we are talking to a number of clubs about them. Um, on seniors, for instance, we've talked to clubs too about clubs that are in a close vicinity about combining, you know, whether it's a four and two sheet or et cetera. So please, if you have any thoughts on those two championships, um, reach out to us. We're also working on 25 and 26 sites. We've got a couple of those locked in um, and working on, uh, on trial sites for 25 as well. So uh, that that work continues, and and I think the the big goal there is to get well ahead of it, so we're not uh, where we were before. We're not quite there yet, in my mind, but we're making progress. So appreciate all the clubs that are hosting. Appreciate all the clubs that have considered it. And if your club has any interest, please uh, please uh, connect with us. Phil mentioned here if you want to talk to Granite about running the, about the seniors, talk to somebody at Granite Seattle last year. They were great hosts. Um, I think they'll give you a little bit of insight into how uh, we're running events these days. I think it's it's an improvement over the past and less of a burden on the club. Not to say it isn't a big ask of the club, but uh, we're trying to make it easier and certainly make it revenue positive for clubs. Um, I'm just looking in here, John Gillespie, uh, circling back to previous question, if we oh, uh, if we collect basic dues, how quickly would that show in their profile? So if we tell them to wait until X to upgrade, well, ideally you're uh, submitting those dues December 1st or earlier, John, and we're getting that we're getting those things loaded into the in as quickly as we can. And we're going to be working with Sport 80. And like I said, we've made a, another higher in membership services to make that process as, as quick as we can. So um, your point is a good one. If somebody wants to upgrade, uh, they're going to need that membership reflected in their profile quickly. Um, Patty Fox from Race Lake. Um, so the, determining the number of, of individual members will be, you know, the total will be November 30 of 2024. Uh, if a club submits, collects the membership and submits them, then it would be, you know, obviously when they do that, we'd have an, we'd, we'd know their individual number of members, but any members that would be added would then be, would be added through November 30th. Um, if you have um, a different dues collection date that doesn't work with December 1st, please reach out to us. Um, I know there are a few clubs, a board member, uh, Jeff Annis's Club Mapleton doesn't really get started until mid-December. So we will work with clubs like yours on an individual basis um, and, and make it work as much as, as much as we can. Did you see John Gillespie's follow-up? Dean? Yeah. Yeah, John, I, I would hope it's uh, two weeks. Uh, you know, obviously, Jen is probably uh, who deals, who has dealt with uploading rosters in the past. Um, you know, we're going to try to do it as quickly as we can. Obviously, we're going to have to. So. Looking to see if there's any other hands up. Yeah, if you think it's Jenna, it would be two hours. Well, yeah, except, um, yeah. So we, we are getting help there, though. So it's not going to be just um, just on Jenna. Um, speaking of at-large, any feeling for when you guys might be able to announce Dave's location for arena at-large playdowns? Hoping we can do that uh, very early next week. We have an MOU out with the arena in Atlanta. Um, memo of understanding once they sign on it, uh, we'll announce that. And I, I'd agree it's getting tight. It wasn't an easy one to find. Um, but the tentative date for it, I, 
you know, the date that we're working with is Labor Day weekend in Atlanta for that play down uh, to give you a little insight into that. Um, of course, we're, we want to get the registration set up as quickly as possible so we know the number of teams and how many days we need. So as soon as we get that MOU signed by the arena uh, facility, we'll, we'll get you we'll keep you posted on it. Just just know, everybody, that we don't we never want to delete. Um, uh, we never want to delay announcements about host sites or championship sites. Uh, we try to do them as soon as before the ink is dry in an MOU, but we do like to have the MOU signed before we announce those. And David, I can understand the challenge around Labor Day weekend, um, good and bad with Labor Day weekend. Some people have told me they like it because it's, uh, it is a holiday weekend. Of course, I can understand others who may not like it as much. Ice technician training, Patty from Rice Lake. Yes, we're continuing to work on that. We have a uh, the World Curling Federation, World Academy of Sport. We're doing an event uh, at Rock Creek in uh, in Colorado uh, in at, towards the end of August, where we are going to train a number of ice technician educators at that, and then we will be adopting the WCF ice technician. Uh, uh, certification system and those who are trained on that uh, at Rock Creek will be around the country to conduct those clinics. So we, along with uh, coaching and coaching education and coaching certification, we want to improve our ice tech training and education as well. And we decided that the, the simplest way forward was to adopt the WCF model, which is I think a good one. And they're, they're going to, we have uh, funds from the WCF to pay for this training weekend. So uh, I think it'll be great. Sean Olson has put together a crew of ice techs who will take the training and then it's, it's a train the trainer session is what it is. There's also one following the ice tech um, training for officials. So we'll do a train the trainer for, so we'll have more officials who can run clinics around the country as well. Um, trying to think if I missed anything here. Coming up at 9.32, so I'm going to say we give it just a few more minutes if anybody else has another question. Um, is there separate ice tech training for arena ice away from dedicated ice club? I will say that we just had an arena ice tech session with uh, Lauren Rich and Sean Olson. That was thanks to the Arena Club Working Group for putting that together. Um, the Arena Club Working Group is an active one, and we'll do more around that. Um, we are also, I know I've said it a million times, but we just had another call with our content platform provider, and we're pretty sure by the end of next week, we'll have that platform up, and there will be things in there for Ice Techs and Arena Club Ice Techs as well. Um, I think you just jinxed it, Dean. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'll be thrilled when it's up. I have uh, credit to Jenna and, and others who have worked on that, but we've had no shortage of technology problems. And as much as I love Apple products, I've been ready to really get frustrated with Apple. So anyways, um, there's the link Jenna just put in there, the link to the recorded sessions. Um, Carrie asks, will competitive curlers have the option to upgrade their basic membership during the competition registration process? Yes, um, you'll need to do that in order to register for, for certain events. So, yep. Before we go, I'll just, I'll just add that uh, first, I appreciate board members who are on and Brett who are on and all their guidance through this. Appreciate the, TAS, the governance committee and all the work they did and appreciate the feedback from everyone here. Obviously, we don't have everything perfectly sorted out. Um, you know, I would have hoped maybe there were a couple things that, that we thought of before they came up in this call tonight, but we will sort those out. Um, and I do apologize to any of the regional leadership who felt left out. That's on me for not uh, alerting you maybe as much as you should have, but we do, uh, we'll have those meetings. And I, I think that the issues that were raised can be worked through and, um, I think we're going to find a, a, a better relationship with our regional associations going forward. So with that, it's 9.34. If there's any last questions, I'll answer them. But I think um, 
I definitely appreciate this. Uh, yeah, the set, some of the Patty just asked, we do record these sessions. It will be available online. Um, appreciate everyone's, again, feedback and patience going forward. I mean, we're, we, like I said to everyone at USA Curling that we're not going to get everything right, but we will own our mistakes. Um, but we will try to fix things as much as we can. And I, I do think that this will be a, uh, a really good model going forward. So, and, and if anything from the surveys that the, that the committee did, it does indicate that, you know, I, I think what, what the committee came back with was overall the sentiment of, of the curling community. So thanks. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up, I think. Thanks everybody. Uh, Jenna just said it, we'll, we'll have the recording posted to our YouTube channel, usually in a, in a day or so, so. Nice, nice uh, gif there, Phil. Is it gif or jif or am I dating myself? All right, thanks everybody.